tap into the passion and vision of well-known entertainment luminaries with Thinking Out Loud. Go on a journey with unfiltered access to today's media innovators. Hear their strategy for rising above the crowded landscape. Important lessons and valuable wisdom that only comes from real industry experience. Hello, I'm Vicki Linz, President and CEO of CTAM, a marketing organization focused on the media, entertainment, and technology industry. Today, I'm speaking with Alan Sippenwall, Rolling Stone's chief TV critic and an author who's written, among other things, The Revolution Was Televised, TV the Book, and Breaking Bad 101. And Alan, you've been doing this now for a quarter of a century. Oh, my God, yeah. (laughs) Let's just start by saying, what's changed? Like, take us through that journey over the past couple of of decades. I started doing this in 1996, and I remember we would get uh, VHS cassettes of all of the new shows coming to the networks and to cable at that time. I was literally, right before we did this, cleaning out my home office, and I found, like, the tapes for the pilot of, like, Deadwood and Two and a Half Men and a number of other things I've, I've covered over the years and there was just so much less content. So it was possible to basically keep abreast of almost everything if you wanted to. And so I would frequently check in on shows that I was not necessarily the hugest fan of. Just like, hmm, I wonder what Jag's been up to lately. That kind of thing. It was a civilized <laughs> beat at the time, but it was also not necessarily the most respected beat because it was TV. Even though the mid-90s was a very good time for television, I would meet people at parties or whatever. And they would say, well, what do you do? I'm a TV critic. And they would sort of be a little confused. And then they would say, oh, do you write about movies? And I would say no. And then they would look like they felt a little sorry for me. Like, oh, you know, you write about entertainment, (laughs) but you don't cover movies. Who really cares about TV anyway? And obviously all of those things have changed a, a whole heck of a lot in the last 24, 25 years. And now it's all merging together. Yeah, there are no movies anymore. At least there's no movie theaters. Every, you know, Everything at the moment in the pandemic is coming here. You also have a lot of filmmakers coming to television and making what they like to call 10-hour movies. So the lines have completely blurred, if not shattered altogether. But before we jump into that, I, I want to try to do this in a way that's going to take our, our listeners through a narrative, if you will. And so I want to start with peak TV. You, you mentioned the amount of content has changed. And we have been in a time of frequently called peak TV, where the proliferation of content is explosive. The pace was explosive. And I think we were starting to near a, a point of potentially overwhelming the the viewers. I don't think we were nearing that point. I think we were well past that point, Vicki. Do do you really? You you think that people were just so completely overwhelmed? So this leads me into two different places with you, and you pick the direction you'd like to go. Sure. If there's too much to watch, then has the role of the critic become more important because you can help guide the audience to what they should pick? Obviously, that's a self-serving answer on my part. You know, yes, I'm awesome. Please keep me employed, all of that. Please keep reading me. But I will say that it's changed my role. There was a period starting in the mid-2000s, going through about 2012, 2013, where primarily what I was doing at that point was recapping, because that seemed to be what the audience wanted, was I know the shows I like already. I want to dig deeper on them. Please write about every episode of all of these shows and and we can have the shared experience. And I still do some of that to a degree, but really sometime in the mid 2010s, it became much more, Alan, there's too much on. I don't know what to watch. Please tell me what to watch. I pivoted hard back into primarily trying to review as much new and returning stuff as I could and try to, I, I guess the popular term these days is to curate an experience where you say, all right, well, this, if you like this, you should watch this. If you don't like this, don't watch that. And really try to point people towards things that will make good use of their time. Because I hear all the time from people saying, you know, that they're paralyzed by choice, that they spend too long scrolling through, you know, their on-demand menu or, or the menu of whatever service they're using. And they just pick something out of desperation to pick something. And then they're not happy with it. So I'm trying the best that I can to say, No, just go straight here. You'll be much happier. How many episodes of something do you typically watch before you write about it? 
It varies. Like we, there's a show debuting uh, in a couple of days after we record this where I've heard that they were only going to give me one episode. And I said, I'm not going to review a show off of one episode because that's not enough to really get a sense. These days we're, we're often being sent full seasons. And then there's a part of me that feels obligated to, oh, I should watch everything that they've sent me because you never know. And then there's another part of me that says, well, if this thing hasn't grabbed me after three or four hours, maybe it's just not doing its job and I don't owe it getting to the rest of the season. Even if the rest of the season is much better, again, it just becomes a question of time management and triage. And how can you possibly keep up with all of this? So if you can't really get to the good stuff until, you know, episode seven, eight, nine, you might want to rethink what you're doing. But I try whenever possible to watch most, if not all, of what I've been given, which varies from show to show. Do you think that all of this content and all of this choice is impacting the development of programming? Is it more important now for shows to grab viewers faster? Viewers are likely to to do exactly what you just outlined. You know, gosh, I have so many choices and there's so many things I want to watch. I can't get to it all. If I'm not really into something in the first three or four hours, I'm out of here. Yeah, I mean, sometimes if if I'm not really into something in the first three or four minutes, you know, the peak TV makes everybody a much tougher critic overall. I, I think it's changing things in a couple of ways. One of which is you are definitely seeing more of a pivot towards really high concept things because when you try to describe to someone, you know, what should I watch? If you just say, oh, you know, you should see this show. It's a really good private detective show. It doesn't matter how good you say it is. It's just going to sort of sound like white noise. Whereas if I describe a show to someone where the actual premise sounds novel or funny or surprising or anything like that, you're much more likely to say, oh, I want to try that. That sounds cool. So what the show is about uh, has, at least for the moment, become almost more important than how good it is. Uh, So that's one way in which things have changed. The other way, sort of conversely to that, is I feel like there's a lot of cases where the concern is, again, less about quality than it is about just sort of filling the time. So there's a lot of these shows being made now, uh, especially serialized dramas, where it's really more about, like, they understand that it's just a thing you're going to have on while you're checking Instagram or, you know, you're playing Candy Crush or whatever it is that you're doing on another screen. And so long as, like, something exciting happens every 20 minutes or so, or as long as there's a big cliffhanger and then, you know, your interface is going to keep playing the next episode, you don't necessarily have to work as hard as you did in the days when people were more conditioned to watch things on a linear basis, as opposed to coming in after all the episodes are available. There's been some shift in the length of seasons. It seems to me like there's a proliferation of both documentaries and miniseries. What do you see happening in terms of format and viewer preference? Are we as a people less likely to commit to to hoping we write out 10 seasons of our favorite show now? Are we looking for shorter hits? I think we're definitely looking for shorter hits. A lot of the time, if I recommend a show that's already completed and it's run like five or six seasons, even if they were only doing 10 episodes a season, that's 50 to 60 hours. And a lot of people just seem really intimidated by that, no matter how great that show might have been. So on the one hand, like I think people often sound almost relieved if you say, a show only ran two years or a show only did six episodes a season, or it's a half hour show. But on the other hand, you also have a lot of these projects being made now that were very clearly designed as movies and just got expanded because the money was better on cable or on streaming uh, to do it that way. And so you have these projects that are like, should have been 90 minutes, two hours at the most, and now run eight or 10 hours because that's the format in which television operates most comfortably these days. And so everything is stretched out way beyond the point of interest in both scripted and in documentaries. You know, people are really excited. They were really excited about The Vow initially when it came on. And then I I could sort of sense as the weeks went on, the social media conversation changed. And there were a number of people saying, well, I really like this, but like, when is it going to end? And then right before the finale aired, HBO announced that they were going to do another season. And it seemed like social media as a whole threw up its arms in exasperation of, uh, 
look, I just want the story. Like, please keep stop dragging it out. So there's definitely a sense of like, we're going to give you as much as we possibly can to keep our hooks in you at least for a couple of years. And that doesn't necessarily serve story as well as, you know, keeping things compact. So let's talk about the pandemic and the effect it's had on TV. We know viewers are home more, obviously watching more. They've gone on interesting journeys of search and discovery and and expanded their viewing universe. So everybody's numbers are looking very different than they did before. I don't know that anyone has a very good sense of what's going to last. What do you see is happening right now? And what do you think will carry forward as lasting change? I've definitely had a, heard a lot more about people binging or looking for binges. I've had a lot of people saying, oh, you know, I finally watched The Sopranos. You know, now I'm going to go get your Sopranos book. Things like that where they're, it, it's become a good opportunity for people to cross shows off their bucket list. And it almost feels just anecdotally like the shows that are benefiting most are slightly older shows as opposed to current things. Although you definitely do hear of, of shows popping over the course of these last nine, 10 months, however God long it's been at this point. But it's, I don't know if we're going to have a full picture on how the pandemic has changed viewer behavior. It has certainly made TV feel even more vital than before. I, I've been doing recording my own podcast, which is going to debut sometime next year, and they're celebrity guests. And at the beginning of every episode, I ask them what they're watching. And with only one or two exceptions, they're just all listing shows that they found. They're, you know, they're not really watching movies uh, as much. So it seems like the pandemic has played this role in pushing TV's ascendancy even higher in terms of like, this is the thing you put on at the end of the night when you're done with dinner and you're just getting ready to relax and you want to enjoy something. So that's been good. Uh, But economically, I think we've got a long way to go before we can figure out just how much the pandemic is going to change what we're getting and how much of it. You wrote an interesting piece recently about, I think, you call them unrenewals? Yes. So talk to us a little bit about what we're seeing there and and what a bummer it must be to to get picked up and renewed and then have an about face happen that changes that status. Yeah, there have been a bunch of shows that have either been canceled outright because of the pandemic where various outlets have said, all right, well, we can't afford this anymore. But then there have also been, like you said, the unrenewals where it's a show like Glow, for instance, that had been renewed for a fourth and final season, had even filmed an episode, I believe, before the pandemic shut down production. And eventually Netflix looked at the numbers and I guess they said, we can't feasibly do this anymore for a variety of reasons. And so you have shows that did get picked up, you know, maybe made something, maybe didn't, and everyone was excited. And now they're not going to happen anymore for logistical or financial reasons or both. And one of the things I've heard is that the cost of COVID proofing shows is just astronomical. Alex Kurtzman, who runs the the Star Trek shows, told the guys at The Hollywood Reporter that it's maybe $500,000 an episode, just like for PPE and other protective measures. And when I went to a bunch of other showrunners, they said that 500,000 might actually be lowballing it uh, because there's just so much you have to do even some basic things like when you drive, when you bus actors from to a location, it used to be that you could fit six, eight people in a van. Now you're only allowed to have two. So you've got to rent more vans. You got to pay more drivers. You've got to overhaul your HVAC systems. You've got to change the way you do catering. You've got to change all kinds of things and do all kinds of preventative measures and shoot shows over longer days and over more days rather so that people are not as exposed to one another. So all of that, like it adds up and it adds up and it adds up. And one of the things I've been wondering for years of peak TV now is at what point will the numbers stop making sense? At what point does making this much product just cost too much for the return you're getting out of it? And I think we finally are hitting that mark because the various networks and cable channels and streamers are looking at this and saying, all right, well, we could afford to make this show before, but we can't now. And so it's, we didn't know what was going to finally burst the peak TV bubble. And unfortunately, it looks like it's going to be COVID. Well, to your earlier point, people are also 
really enjoying discovering older shows or yes. even rewatching older shows. And so there is still this unbelievable amount of content available to people. It doesn't have to be the new stuff that's being pushed through the pipeline all the time. So there's a window of opportunity for the industry to retool itself a bit. That is absolutely true. And sort of one of the unfair things for a lot of new content is it has to compete with the Sopranos and Breaking Bads and Mad Men's and 30 Rocks of this world, which are available with, you know, with a, within a couple of clicks. And so it's not just, is this the best show being made right now? Is it's, is this show better than like 50 other things that are all time classics that are right here via my remote or my tablet uh, very quickly. But the question is like, uh, is everyone going to be making as much money if people are binging old favorites as opposed to watching the new things? You know, how is that just driving subscriber growth, for instance? You know, you often hear that what a lot of these places need is they need new content all the time. I don't know. Biz business and numbers have never been my forte. I've tried to focus mainly on what's good and what's bad. But with just this sheer tonnage of stuff, you almost have to try to figure out, well, is this going to stick around? Is it not? Is it going to end abruptly? And if it ends abruptly, how comfortable do I feel recommending it? Uh, you know, years ago, I always used to say, even if a show is canceled prematurely, if it's really good, you should still watch it because you'll get entertainment. But now when there are so many shows that offer you a complete story from beginning to end, and then you have to pick between that and something that got abruptly canceled after three seasons when they were going to make at least four, like, I don't know if I want to say, all right, well, you should still go and watch Glow, even though it doesn't end. I don't know. That's a really interesting point and, and one that personally hits home with me. I, I don't like falling off a cliff when I've invested time in, in something. I, I like it to end. I, I like there to be some sort of wrap up to, to the story. Even if it's a pending continuation of it, I, I'd like it to, to come to some sort of rational end rather than just being cut off, I think I'd personally be less likely to, to commit. I don't know that I would jump into three seasons if I knew that the fourth never happened. But then it becomes this weird self-fulfilling prophecy because I remember much earlier, there would be times when people would say, all right, well, you know, the Fox network, they cancel everything. I loved Firefly. They canceled Firefly. I'm not going to watch anything on Fox. Uh, you know, I'm not going to start watching anything on CBS. They canceled Jericho. What, whatever the show was, people would sort of get wary. Or they would just get wary about trying anything new at all because you know, the, the response I would hear is, oh, this sounds like a show I I'm going to love and it's going to break my heart because it will get canceled after a season or less and I don't want to do that to myself. And one of the things that happened with Peak TV was suddenly that anxiety went away for a while because almost nothing got canceled prematurely. No matter how like niche it was, no matter how obscure or strange you know, shows would at, at minimum would get a warning and they would say, all right, well, we're only going to do three years, but you're, you, you know, you can write a, a series finale at the end of that third season so you can wrap things up. And now you have a number of shows that are getting canceled before they planned any kind of ending at all. And so suddenly these weird little shows that were able to thrive in the midst of this peak TV abundance, I don't know now if viewers are going to be quite as willing to watch them and then in turn, if they're not watching them in as big numbers, are the various networks and cable channels and streamers going to be as willing to order them? And so you may move back away from this incredible variety where right now I say to people, you know, I can't find anything I like. If they say that, I say, well, you're not looking hard enough because there is a show out there right now that is going to be your favorite show ever made. We just have to help you find it. And I don't know if that's going to be the case in a couple of years as everyone starts moving more towards sure things that they know that the audience is going to check out. Well, the old broadcast model was always, you know, renewals happened after seasons ended. Show runners wouldn't necessarily know whether or not they had been renewed or were going to be renewed when they were wrapping storylines for a season. I feel like that's changing now a bit. I'm wondering if the streaming universe has forced their hands a bit because viewers are expecting stories to come to some kind of comfortable closure rather than just cutting everything off at the knees? Is that just my own perception here? I think that was definitely the case for the last four, five, six years. Absolutely. But I do feel like it's shifting now. I think you have a lot of shows 
that are being left to twist in the wind. You know, one of the things I most enjoyed over the last couple of months was Lovecraft Country on HBO. That still hasn't been renewed. I don't know if it's going to be. I don't know if it's going to prove too expensive. I don't really, you know, know exactly what the numbers were or what the threshold is for HBO at this point. But it, it, if it didn't end on a cliffhanger, it left with certain things up in the air. And that's happening more and more now where in st- it used to be for the last several years, a sh- the, the season two renewal would be announced like right before you premiered to give the show an extra bump of publicity or shows would be ordered on a two year season order to begin with. And I feel like people are uh, starting to get more conservative. And as a result, you don't know. There's definitely going to be a lot more uncertainty over the next few years than there have been over the few before that. So we've talked a little bit about all of this content, the role of the critic becoming more important in helping to guide folks through this sea of content. There's a cultural conversation that, that absolutely starts to happen around some programs that lift them up. You're at Rolling Stone. You have a tremendous platform for, for driving cultural conversation. What does that look like from your perspective? Are you a hit maker? Do you look at a show and think, I can make something of this, I can lift it up? Or do you leave it to the viewers and try to just take more of a backseat role in, in how you review and recap and position content? I don't think I have any illusions about my power to make or break a show. I, I think that the audience does that much more than me. I mean, I do occasionally hear anecdotally people say, well, oh, Alan's recapping this. Therefore, I'm going to watch it because he he takes this seriously. Or you know, if you reviewed this, I'm going to look at it. But I don't, I don't think that that's a big enough number to to move the needle on anything, even at a big platform like Rolling Stone, just because there's too much choice out there uh, for that to happen. So what I look at it is just, I'm going to write about what interests me because there's too much content for me to have any illusions about being able to cover it all. So it's, am I excited? Am I not excited? Do I want to encourage other people to see this? Do I want to tell people, oh, this thing that's got a lot of hype, maybe you want to pump the brakes. It's it's not going to live up to it. Things like that. I'm just trying to provide service as best that I can. But, you know, I'm not going to get everything. I'm not. I'm going to miss some things. There are some shows that people go gaga over that either didn't click with me or just not my thing to begin with. Succession, <laughs> I often get made fun of on TV Twitter for being the one, like, prominent TV critic who does not love Succession. Um, Apple had a show this summer called Ted Lasso, which I thought was pretty good. And a lot of other people responded feeling like it was, the, you know, uh, a lifeline that they desperately needed during the pandemic. And it's their new favorite thing. And I'm, I'm really happy for them that they feel that way. Whereas I just sort of like, all right, this is a nice show. I enjoyed it. And that's okay. I just, people should like what they like. And I'm at those moments where my interest intersects with the audience's interest on something like a Breaking Bad, that's great. Uh, but when it doesn't, that's okay too. I'm, I'm going to write about what excites me. And I really appreciate the fact that my editors at Rolling Stone have enough faith in me to know that like, that's what I should do as opposed to trying to chase the hits. Fair enough. That's a good take actually to know when we're reading something that a critic has written, what, what's the filter, right? What, you know, what's, is there an agenda here? What are they trying to draw? And especially when you're, when you're tied to a brand like Rolling Stone. And I think that the role of brands in this media environment is also really interesting. And so I do think that Rolling Stone readers come to expect a framework for what's being discussed and how it's being discussed and your interests fall within that framework. And so there's some sort of expectation set there. Let's transition that thought to TV network brands, program brands. It, this whole content universe is kind of messy right now from a brand perspective. You mentioned FX earlier and people would go to watch things on FX and really knew what to expect from that. HBO is another one. Now we've got big streaming brands, encompassing lots of cable brands, broadcast brands, broadcast show brands. We've got, you know, where do people go to find some guidance on what to expect? Or is that brand equity all just getting mashed up in, in peak TV? And it it's all about the program and the program reputation. I think it is getting mashed up a fair amount. Like I couldn't necessarily 
necessarily tell you, for instance, what what the Netflix brand is other than we have everything. You know, the Netflix nowadays operates very much like a CBS or an NBC would have when I started doing this job. It's just they're sort of trying to cover as many different constituencies as they possibly can. FX was always a really good and reliable brand. And even if I didn't love all of their shows, you sort of, you could look at it and say, all right, I understand why that's an FX show and everything they try is at least interesting. And I'm going to check it out, even if it's not for me, ultimately. Um, now, a lot of their stuff is, is on Hulu. Some of it premieres directly on Hulu. Uh, and while that's sort of siloed off in this FX on Hulu area, Hulu has lots of other programming, both the stuff they make and the stuff that they've acquired or licensed. And so it's very easy for some of these shows to get lost in the shuffle with that, as opposed to feeling very clearly like this is FX. When Warner Media set up their streaming service, they decided to call it HBO Max because they thought, all right, well, the HBO brand, you know, great brand recognition, people love it. What's happened is it just created this confusion where people aren't sure quite what HBO Max is versus HBO. And then there's other things like Cinemax shows are not on HBO Max. And like, why should I get this as opposed to just keeping my HBO subscription and all of that? And it's really, it's, it's done no one any favors. And so the idea of anyone having a really consistent brand of, oh, anything they do, I'm going to check out. I think that's mostly gone away. There's very few places, even FX to a degree is maybe the last bastion of that, just because some, so much of their stuff is now blurring with what's on Hulu. I don't know that you're going to necessarily have a lot of people saying, all right, well, I'm definitely going to try anything by them. And so that's another area in which I, I'm just doing the best I can to stay afloat and say, all right, if you like this, this is more in that vein, but it may be from a place that you're not used to getting your content from. How often, you know, you're being pitched all the time. There, people are, are constantly reaching out to you, wanting you to write about their shows. How often do you write about the things you are pitched? versus the things that you just find on your own as you're sorting through that universe of content? I would say very rarely does a pitch get me to watch something. It's just, that's not, that's not how I operate anymore. It's every now and then, like it will alert me to something that I was not aware existed and sounds like my kind of thing. But the vast majority of the pitches I get are just sort of like mass mailings, not in any way, you know, taking into consideration what I do, I get pitched a lot of reality stuff. For instance, I haven't written about uh, reality television in a very long time. So it's more just me seeking stuff out. I will say sometimes like individual publicists at places that I tend to write about anyway, might be able to push me towards something I might not have otherwise considered. So if somebody at an HBO or a Netflix or an FX or a Showtime says, hey, we really think this is up your alley, that might move it to the front of the pile, but odds are I was going to look at that anyway. So it's very rare to for a pitch to turn into something. It does happen every now and again, but honestly, like I, when I go through my email and my inbox pings, the vast majority is kind of shaking my head and saying, well, you know, you, you could have saved yourself the trouble. Earlier, we talked about the sort of blurring of TV, movies, Another way we've seen that happen is with the celebrities who are are signing up for projects all over the place now. And back in the day, it used to be that the A-listers did movies and then the A-minus-listers did TV. And, you know, we see huge talent gravitating to TV because of the creative freedom and the deals that are being done. And, and that's resulting in a lot of big budget, big attention projects. How much of that bubbles up on your radar screen simply because of the names attached to it, getting attention? And then are you more likely to watch and write about those projects? I think we, we've we well passed the point where it's like eyebrow raising. If, if someone who has a thriving big movie career comes and does a TV project, especially since most of the people who are still like can open a movie if they come to TV, it's usually for a limited series. So you've been in those rooms at TCA and CTAM panels where a reporter will say, you know, well, why did you choose to do TV? And I feel like the moment to ask that has, has kind of passed because it's just, it, the thing speaks for itself at this point. In a lot of cases, what's being made in the movies, uh, especially in like bigger budget movies, is action franchises and superheroes and other kind of tent poles. So if you want to play the kind of character parts 
that a Meryl Streep played, that a Nicole Kidman, a Reese Witherspoon, a Matthew McConaughey, you know, got to play at the the height of their careers. You almost have to come to TV to do it outside of like a micro budget, you know, awards bait kind of film. So th there's a lot of that going on. Definitely sometimes seeing the seeing an actor I like will encourage me to watch something, but that's not necessarily about, oh, it's a movie star. It's just an, it's an actor whose work I've already liked on te television. So, you know, Brian Cranston has a Showtime show coming up uh, later this year, I think called The Judge. And I love Brian Cranston, but I love him because of Breaking Bad and Malcolm in the Middle and the fact that he is now one of the biggest stars in the world. That's nice, but I just want to watch it because I think he's a tremendous actor. What is your take on the mega deals that a lot of showrunners are, are cutting right now? And what is your expectation for the content that'll come out of those types of relationships? Well, more power to them. And, and I clearly picked the wrong profession when I look at some of those numbers. But if people can make money, that's great. Uh, and especially if they can make this big amount of money, that's, that's good for them. It kind of varies. Like you look at, like Netflix right now seems to be making a lot of these mega overall deals. And they've had mixed results with them. Like Ryan Murphy has just been churning out show after show after show. And most of what he has done for Netflix has not been at the better end end of the Ryan Murphy spectrum. He's a, a creator capable of making some of the best shows on TV and making some of the worst shows on TV. And for the most part, the stuff he's made for them has, has not been great. Uh, Shonda Rhimes signed a deal like two years ago, maybe more at this point, And we have not gotten a single Netflix show from her. Finally, Bridgerton is going to premiere around Christmas. I'm actually going to watch an episode of that later today, but I haven't seen it yet. So I don't know how much value Netflix necessarily feels they've gotten out of that so far. And then you've got Kenny Barris, who, you know, his first Netflix show was basically a remake of his most popular ABC show, only starring him. And now there's already talk that he's looking to get out of that and do an overall deal somewhere else. So, I mean, sometimes it can work really well. And especially if, if someone is prolific and consistent, but I don't, I don't necessarily know if that's the healthiest thing as opposed to everybody kind of going project to project because then you're buying based on the idea as opposed to based on the person and assuming that everything that that person does is great when, you know, nobody bats a thousand in this industry ever. Well, you, your batting average is better than most. So I'm going to wrap <laughs> up with you. what are your favorite programs right now? What should we be paying attention to? Let's see. I'm, I'm, the best thing I saw all this year was Better Call Saul. That's a really impressive show that I had really low expectations for, despite loving Breaking Bad, just because spinoffs and prequels and things about sort of minor characters have a really shaky track record. And it's now become basically about as good as the original show, which I never would have expected was possible. So that was terrific. But let's see, more recently, I really did like like Lovecraft Country a ton even though it was wildly inconsistent, but the, the highs of it were just incredibly, unbelievably high. I'm enjoying the return of the Mandalorian. That's, I mean, it's a kid show. So it's fun for me to watch with my children, but it's executed at a really good level. That's enjoyable. And I've been watching a lot of Fargo this season, which has had its ups and downs, but is heading towards what I hope will be a really good stretch at the finish. Alan, uh, thanks so much for spending time with us today. Thank you for having me. This was fun. Hope you found this Thinking Out Loud conversation interesting and perhaps even thought-provoking. There are more on the way. Don't forget to subscribe to the podcast and leave a review. 